Warning, the following podcast contains massive spoilers. If you haven't seen Avatar The Last Airbender and Legend of Korra yet, and don't mind spoilers, hopefully this podcast will inspire you to watch along with us. Now let's begin. So, we are back in the South Pole. Katara drags Aang to meet the villagers. The village backs away as Aang bows. Aang notices this and questions it. Katara's grandma, or grand-gran, says the world hasn't seen an airbender in over a hundred years, and everyone basically thought that they were extinct. Extinct, Aang says. Sokka grabs the stick that Aang is holding and asks what it is. Aang takes it back and tells him that it's a glider. He taps the stick on the ground and the wings shoot out. After listening to a bunch of Sokka's snarky comments, Aang takes off into the sky and starts airbending. The whole village stares in awe. Aang accidentally flies into Sokka's watchtower and destroys it. (laughs) Sokka gets upset and yells out how he's sick of benders. Aang gets excited when he realizes that Katara is the other bender and that she's not just a bender, she's a water bender. Gran Gran interrupts and pulls Katara aside and warns her that she shouldn't put too much hope into Aang, but Katara doesn't agree. Katara believes that Aang has a lot to teach her. We cut back to Zuko's ship. Zuko is practicing his firebending. It's two versus one. Uncle Iroh is frustrated with him. He tells Zuko that power in firebending comes from the breath, not his muscles. Uncle Iroh says, the breath becomes energy in the body. The energy extends past your limbs and becomes fire. Zuko gets fed up with this and asks him for the next set of moves. Uncle Iroh refuses and tells Zuko that he hasn't even mastered the basics yet and tells him to drill again. Zuko gets angry and kicks a large stream of fire towards the soldier that knocks him overboard. He then tells Uncle Iroh that the Avatar is the last airbender and is probably an old man by now. He's had a hundred years to master all four elements. Zuko demands the next set from Uncle Iroh so that he can defeat him. Uncle Iroh stubbornly agrees, but not until he finishes his bowl of food. We go back to the village and Sokka is giving an inspirational pep talk to a bunch of little boys about how you shouldn't show fear when you face a firebender. One of the boys raises his hand and says that he has to pee. Sokka tells him to hold it and that he needs to learn how to be a true man while his dad and the others are away fighting in the war. But his lesson becomes moot because all of the other boys need to pee as well. (laughs) Sokka gets frustrated. Katara barges in and asks Sokka if he's seen Aang. Aang comes out of the bathroom igloo and tells the little boys that everything freezes in there. The boys laugh. Sokka is annoyed and tells Katara to take him out of his sight. He then turns around and sees all of the little boys sliding down off his tail into a pile of snow. Sokka runs over and starts yelling at them. He tells Aang that they don't have time for fun, not with the war going on. Aang's like, what war? Before Sokka can answer, Aang spots a penguin and starts running towards it. We see Aang playing with the penguins. Katara laughs and wants to make a deal with Aang. She tells him that she'll help him catch a penguin if he teaches her waterbending. Aang says he is an airbender, not a waterbender, and asks if there's someone in the tribe that can teach her. Katara tells him no, and that she's the only waterbender in the whole South Pole. This really upsets Aang. He tells Katara that a waterbender needs to master water and recommends finding someone in the North Pole. Katara tells him that they haven't had contact with their sister tribe in a long time because they're basically on the other side of the world. Aang reminds Katara that he has a flying bison and offers her a ride to the North Pole. Katara hesitates. She's never left home before. Aang tells her to think about it while the two try to catch a penguin. Katara pulls out a piece of fish and tosses it at Aang. A whole group of penguins flock towards Aang and tackles him. (laughs) Again, we, we see how, going back to what you said about Sokka and how he is the only man in the village, and he's trying to prepare all of these little boys. And it's just not... It's not gonna happen. (laughs) Yeah, I think it's... uh, It's heartbreaking because not only is he trying to teach these boys how to ready themselves and to protect their village, I think he's also trying to, like, build peers. And he's trying to get them onto the same level of thinking that he is. Mm. Because I can imagine that Sokka's really lonely. I really don't think, like, the moms and the other 
you know, ladies of the village are telling them, go go to Sokka so you can learn. I think Sokka is essentially just like a babysitter at this point, and he yeah. takes it upon himself to teach them. So I think it's really sad, but then also just really, really cute how the kids react. Because they're still kids. It's like this sense of innocence versus growing up. And how Sokka and Katara have had to grow up really fast when the war was going on. Like these kids were babies. They don't remember, they don't have the same traumatic experiences as they do. Mm. And so there is like this generational gap Mm -hmm. that you definitely see Sokka being frustrated with. Aang is like the catalyst for this sense of pure innocence like reflected with the children maybe that's why he like all the children love him because Mm -hmm. he's just he lets them be yeah he doesn't tell them to suppress you know what is natural and again because they're in a state of war like they don't know that there's this urgency and there's a state of vigilance that they have to have so yeah i don't know ang just becomes this like beacon of light and fun and it's so cute that they use appa as a slide (laughs) (laughs) Oh, and it's like more, not more symbolism, but the fact that they're using the little like tool, the spear that Sokka has, not as a tool for violence, but for fun. And I think that's really cute. (laughs) And then you see just like this instant karma. Poor, poor Sokka. Like whenever he like, (laughs) whenever he starts hating on someone, it just bites him in the butt. Like he, um, what is it? He openly mocks Aang in front of everyone. And in return, Aang accidentally, I don't know if he purposefully, but like in his recklessness, he just destroys Sokka's watchtower that he probably (sighs) spent so long making because he's a normal human being that doesn't know how to bend and (laughs) Aang just destroys it like that. Oh, but then also, I don't know, going back to the idea of like hypervigilance, right? Aang literally destroys or like breaks down the tower which serves as this like again symbol for Sokka to like to have his like his guard up all the time and by breaking that I think it symbolizes what's going to come later right (gasps) like when he's around Aang he can relax a little bit yeah Yeah. so good like the three they like carry each other's weight kind of thing I don't know, Aang just looks so, like, dumb and, like, cute, <laughs> flying around, like, look at me, everyone! Um, <laughs> like, I don't know if I'm jumping ahead, but also, like, going to Zuko and Uncle Iroh, right? Like, him preparing to fight this grizzled avatar, right? Like, it just makes me think of, we know what he doesn't know, that the avatar is a kid. So, like, imagine, like, dramatic irony. If we didn't know that, if we only saw it through Zuko's eyes, it makes his task even more foolhardy, right? It's even more like, you're crazy. You think you're gonna take on this, you know, this fender with all this experience by yourself or whatever, Mm -hmm. right? It makes it even more, like, impossible, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like, I'm just looking at it like, we take a lot of the things in the show lightly because we're shown all of the aspects. So, like, with Zuko, we know that. Aang is just a kid and he doesn't know how to bend. He only knows how to air bend. So like they're a little bit more on level playing ground or whatever. Mm-hmm. So we know that. And on the other side of things with the water tribe, it's really easy to make light of Sokka's vigilance because Zuko isn't necessarily going to be like that ruthless or whatever, mm-hmm. right? In Sokka's point of view, he doesn't know that. He thinks that if they're found, like imagine if it were like Azula going for them instead, yeah. you know, right? He's thinking of the worst case scenario. Mm-hmm. And like, that's why for him, it's so scary. And that's why like, it's so important to him to be so ready. So they do a really good job at balancing the tone in that like, we are shown all the sides. And we know that given everything, their situation is serious, but it's not extremely dire. Looking at any other, like, I don't know how to say it, like, it's sad, but it's not scary. It's because of all the humor, right? Because of all, like, the, again, like, the tonal, like, how they choose to use the tone. But the thing is, for Sokka, it is that scary, you know? And that's, the, like, the saddest thing about it. And for, like, a 13, 14-year-old to go through all that, it's like, ugh. And then you parallel that with how Zuko's preparing to, and, and you brought it up, how Zuko is also thinking the very worst. Because he he understands that if he is going against the Avatar, it's somebody who's mastered the four elements. But not only mastered it, but has been practicing it for a century. 
at the very least. So there's, you can sense that like urgency and that fear and you can begin to see why he's so agitated with his uncle because he's like, if this is real, like you're not preparing me and I'm freaking out, why aren't you doing anything? And then yeah. again, it tempers it because we know that the Avatar is not this person who can just obliterate Zuko, even though Aang does a really good job later <laughs> of doing that. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. Like, it's just, it's interesting to see the parallel, how these two young boys have had to prepare for the worst, and mm. that dramatic irony of, like, it's not that bad, like, <laughs> there's a way. The, the yeah. show's Uncle Iroh, just chill out. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's all right. It's gonna work out. <laughs> Speaking of dramatic irony, there's like this third dramatic irony where Aang doesn't know about the war. So you got like the first one where Katara and Sokka don't know that he's the airbender. You got the second one where Zuko doesn't know that the Avatar is only 12 years old. You got the third one where Aang doesn't know about the war. And so you see in the, in the next episode, like all of these worlds collide and the truth comes out and it gets crazy. <laughs> One thing I want to talk about is my only critique in the sound design, and I'm going to forgive it because it's the pilot episode, but when we see firebending for the first time, when Zuko's fighting two of the crew members, you hear just him going, or like Dante Basco going, Whoa! Like, oh. Whoa! and it's really badly edited. So yeah, that's my only critique <laughs> where you watch back and you're like, oh god, they could have done that better. <laughs> Maybe it's... Maybe it's artistic? No. Because, like, like, again, like, it's supposed to draw attention to the fact that he's just going, wah, wah, and I go, Uncle Iroh is like, you're not breathing, you're uh, just being, you're just grunting, yeah. you know? You're like not channeling. Right? Oh, okay. Right? It shows that all he is is aggression and anger and fury, right? And muscle. Oh, right? shit, I and didn't like, think about just, that. That's all you hear from him. Yeah. And um, that's all Uncle Arrow's here. So like, <laughs> oh my god, please. Please. Breathe. Mm -hmm. You do have a point. Because when we see Zuko fight later, he doesn't really breathe that heavily as, and dramatic as when he's like training with these two crew members and firebending. <laughs> I know, it's so cool. Okay, like I, I like the little flavor text that we get. Firebending comes from the breath. Right? It flows through you, you build energy, and that energy extends outwards. And you mentioned this in the in the introduction that you did, how Brian thinks of firebending is cheating because you just make nothing, or you make something so drastic out of thin air. I, I don't get that mentality because airbending is literally doing nothing. You know, like you yeah. you can utilize airbending almost anywhere. I mean, probably not underwater, but you couldn't do that with firebending either, right? So there are limitations to firebending. But the fact that firebending and airbending both involve breath oh. a lot is really cool and how that ties in together when you see how Aang kind of struggles with firebending in that way, right? Because firebending is creating the energy from within you and pushing it outwards yeah. versus manipulating the energy that's already from outside of your body, I think is really yeah. cool. That contrast of how, again, when you place firebending and airbending like side by side, where they draw their energy from, it's from a different place, but how they utilize it, I think is very similar. So firebending is not cheating. <laughs> it is legit. If you think firebending is cheating, then so is airbending. Man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really excited when I get Brian to come on this podcast because he has a lot of opinions. He says he's debated this with countless people, and so I, I can't wait. It's going to be an interesting episode. Yeah. <laughs> well, you can't firebend underwater because you need your breath. You got you scuba need... gear, though. Oh! <laughs> what are you going to yeah. do? But yeah, I appreciate that little insight into firebending that we see because that plays a lot into what happens later with Zuko and having to control his anger mm. with his breath. And in being in control of your anger, you're more in control of your bending, which is like so... Yeah. We also learned that Katara is the only waterbender in the whole South Pole. So this further nails in that she definitely needs to leave the South Pole and train and become the best. And we see her transition from where she is now to where she ended up. 
and it's insane. But it's like hinted, right, that she has so much potential, right? Yeah. Like just her being mad, like crack that whole iceberg, you know? So like we see that potential and like, yeah, it is really exciting to see her like harness that and really hone it and become a master. Yeah. I think it's really important to note that Katara as a pupil, like as a student, there's so much promise there already because from what we see of her, we see her like creating a bubble from the fish, right? Yeah. And then I didn't notice this until this like rewatch, but when Aang is in the avatar state and he comes out of the water and he does this thing, this like circle where he whips the water around, Katara sees that once. And then she gets on the oh, boat shit. and does the same movements that Aang does. Oh my god. Although she doesn't this is the first time she's trying it, right? So she accidentally flings it backwards as opposed to like bringing it all the way around her so then she takes that and it's like okay let me just face the other way and do that yeah. so <laughs> i think yeah there is this they're laying the seeds that it's like of course katara is going to leave she's already a good waterbender in her own right but in the larger scale she needs to step it up and that's just so sad too that we understand why she's the last waterbender in her tribe mm. and the sacrifices that her mom makes makes her water bending more i think special to her in a way and now that i'm talking about it i think sokka sees her water bending as something that's like a curse oh mm. and that's why he's like your magic water or whatever and he kind of scoffs at it because there's there's that association with the water bending as the reason why their mom left so it's just like, yeah oh. <laughs> uh, so back to the boy in the iceberg katara and Aang are penguin sledding Aang launches off the edge of a cliff and is now in front of Katara. It's a race! Katara swerves and launches off another cliff and catches up with Aang. Katara laughs and says, She hasn't done this since she was a kid. You still are a kid, says Aang. There's a really cool sequence of Aang and Katara penguin sledding through a tunnel, but the two get off their penguins when they discover a Fire Navy ship. They look up, and the camera cuts to a long shot of the Fire Navy ship that's been lifted off of the ground by large spikes of ice. Wow, Aang says. Katara tells Aang that the ship is a constant bad reminder for her tribe. Aang starts walking towards the ship. Katara tries to stop Aang and warns him that the ship could be booby-trapped. Aang convinces her to join him by telling her that if she wants to be a bender, she has to let go of fear. Katara gives in and they climb aboard the ship. Mm -hmm. Dramatic music starts playing. <laughs> <laughs> As they explore the abandoned ship, they pass empty hallways until they reach the armory. Katara tells Aang how the ships haunted her tribe since Grand Grand was a little girl. It was part of the Fire Nation's first attacks, Katara says. Now Aang is really confused. <laughs> Aang says he has friends all over the world, even in the Fire Nation, and he hasn't heard of this war. Katara questions Aang how long he's been in the iceberg. Aang doesn't know. Maybe a few days? Katara thinks Aang was in there for over a hundred years. Aang starts freaking out <laughs> and tries to disprove this by saying he doesn't look like a hundred year old man. Katara then tells Aang maybe he doesn't know about the war because he was in the iceberg the whole time. Aang gets overwhelmed and collapses on the floor. He can't believe it. Katara comforts him and tells him there must be a silver lining to all of this. Aang replies that maybe the silver lining is meeting her. Katara smiles and helps get him back up. As they continue through the ship, Aang sets off a booby trap. The ship starts rumbling and the signal launches into the sky. Aang grabs Katara and jumps through the hole on the roof. Zuko sees the signal and watches from a telescope from his ship. He sees Aang hopping down towards the ground floor, carrying Katara. Zuko notes that Aang is quite agile for his old age. Zuko yells at a soldier to wake up his uncle and to tell him he's found the Avatar. The telescope follows Aang and Katara as they head back towards the village. The episode ends with an extreme close-up of Zuko's eye as he says, as well as his hiding place. Dun dun dun! Oh, Aang, you're so stupid in this part. <laughs> What a hypocrite because he says if you want to be a bender you have to face fear. Right? But like literally what got him in this situation is him running away from his responsibilities, mm -hmm. right? And deflecting. And like, yeah, we were talking about how he deflects. He's... <sighs> you get a sense of him being manipulative towards knowing Katara's situation. Aang knows how to manipulate people when it comes towards like getting what he wants. We were saying earlier like 
how childlike Aang is, right? And I think this is just another example of, like most children, he kind of knows how to like intuitively get what he wants. He definitely embodies being a child in the best ways and sometimes the worst ways. And I think this is an example of one of the bad ways that he represents that. You also see how smooth he is and how charming he can be because he knows how to push all the right buttons for everyone that he meets. And it sometimes it's really impressive. At other times, it's like, oh man, you see people falling for Aang's charm when he has other ulterior motives. Yeah, I think there's a veneer there of, again, this like frivolity and this like innocence and youthfulness with Aang. I don't want to say that it's intentional and intentional with malice that he kind of manipulates people in this way, but I think it's definitely created a power dynamic between him and Katara because not only, I mean, they became friends, right? And they're on equal footing in the sense that it's just like, like, hi, you know, we're, we're two young people, but the dynamic has completely shifted and then it will shift back, I believe, in like in the next episode or so when Aang realizes that like, oh, Katara kind of has to like me no matter what I do now because I'm her ticket out of here. <laughs> um, so if I want to go penguin sledding, you're going penguin sledding with me. Fuck. If I want to go into the ship, you're going to go with me because you want to be a waterbender, right? <laughs> and it's not so much that it's, again, with like with evil intentions or with intention to harm, but he notices that he does have that power and he wants to use it to explore and to have further fun with Katara. At, at least that's the way I see it, but it's just really interesting how acute his sense is for that dynamic. It's just like, yeah. well, now I have something you want, so guess we gotta do what, what, what I wanna do. Good thing he's like a good kid. <laughs> oh. <laughs> an evil person because like that kind of sense is like it's scary sometimes <laughs> especially with how young he is i think marilyn brought it up before too how it's really or you come to see it in the dialogue where katara is like i haven't done this since i was a kid right and he's like you still are a kid and that's just so it's heartwarming it's like you know cute back and forth but there's so much meaning behind it and that like katara doesn't see herself as a child anymore and she very clearly is but i mean again it happens in episode two when zuko's like you're just a child too <laughs> that's why that's my dante bosco <laughs> just, just a child <laughs> But then Aang goes, but you're just a teenager. And I think Aang serves kind of as the audience is like, all these characters take so much upon themselves, but it's like, this responsibility shouldn't just be yours. And I think Aang sees that and he projects that onto them because mm -hmm. he has this even greater responsibility. And he wants somebody to tell him that he's just a child and he doesn't have to do that. Aww. But at the same time, I feel for Katara too, because when I was that age or like when I was 16 and when people would patronize me and say like, oh, you're just a kid, like blah, blah, blah. I'll be like, no, I'm an adult. I can both. <laughs> like it's a very kid TV show slash Disney Channel thing <laughs> where 16 year olds, if I'm going to quote like My Chemical Romance, like they think they can take on the world. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's kind of scary because in this show, you see how powerful kids can be towards shaping a future mm -hmm. and how they are the next generation and what adults do that affect their lives plays into how they're going to grow up mm -hmm. and it's just this whole cycle mm -hmm. also can we talk about how Katara was like I fucking told you so there was a booby trap in there <laughs> <laughs> dang no <laughs> it's so great I love how this show has consequences this differs from maybe like half of the shows out there where the screenwriters and the creators definitely pay attention to everyone's actions and the reactions of things. What, like Sokka's sarcasm and mockery butts him in the butt. Like you see like Zuko, Zuko's impatience and his mindless ambition bites him in the butt later. Aang's innocence and, and recklessness and just all of that. <laughs> so good. <laughs> Her I told you so's are like so good. Like um, in episode two, when they're flying away on Appa, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> and then Sokka gets so excited, <laughs> and then it just cuts to just like a still of just Katara looking back, going smirking side eye, Katara going like bitch. <laughs> <laughs> so he's just like, 
whatever. <laughs> I mean, it's whatever. Yeah. But yeah. It's really great. Also, oh my gosh, the shot of the Fire Navy ship being like raised by spikes of ice and the callback to what, season three? Was it season two or season three with a puppet master? And how you see her flashback and she was part of that waterbending group oh. that lifted up that Fire Navy ship to try to save their village. And it's like when you get to that Puppet Master episode, you're just like, oh my god! I just, it also shows the power of waterbenders, right? And how firebenders realize, like, okay, we're fighting in, like, to bring it into real world, world kind of, like, terms. Like, we're fighting in their territory. We're fighting in a place where we clearly have the disadvantage, so we need to make sure that their strongest soldiers or whatever make it out of there because if they can uproot and like land all our ships and if they can break the ice and like cover us in ice like it's so scary but like to know that the power that the waterbenders have still wasn't enough yeah to like overcome the fire nation navy just goes to show like how imperialistic and like awful the fire nation is when it comes to conquering that's what I kind of like don't understand and this is speaking so widely but like the fire nation is a clear parallel or like allegory or however you want to call it to an imperialistic country right they want to go and they want to conquer these people because their way of life is just completely different but I just don't understand what sparks it like what instigates that uh, nationalism that like kind of like weird. yeah that how it's just like actually our way of life is best when these places are so disparate is that how you would say it they're just so far away from one another does this show later on what spurs the fire nation to like conquer people it could be sozin's ambition and you see like the consequences of people in power with ambition like that and how it leads to just mass destruction and maybe yeah like going back to uncle iroh he's trying to guide this ambition to a healthy place Mm -hmm. as opposed to all of uh, zuko's ancestors before him yeah he hopes like we're talking about cycles right yeah and he's hoping to break that cycle with zuko especially since azula is the way she is And this is going to be, like, great as the podcast continues along to see how mental illness plays out. Because, like, the more that I dwell on it and the more that I think on it, like, the idea, too, that, like, overtakes Zuko's great-grandfather probably comes from a place of mental illness. Mm. Like, this place where it's just, like... I don't know. That's that's hard to to create that parallel, right? Because I don't want to say mental illness is the cause of yeah. this and to to forgive that because he's, you know, mentally ill that he does all these bad things. It's, it's wrong to think that way, but I think it definitely plants the seed that like their way of thinking was abnormal and wrong in the sense that I don't know. I'm just kind of spiraling into this, this place. So it's like it's a really touchy subject. And it requires a lot more thinking and, like, drawing more evidence for sure. But it's just like, I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) Also, like, airbending is so OP. And just, he's like, what, he's 12? And he carries Katara and just launches a million feet in the air and just hops down like it's a video game. You definitely see it later, just Sokka struggling when he's trying to keep up with the benders. Yeah. And it's just like little hints of how powerful Aang is as an airbender and how airbending can be useful in like this situation and all of the elements and how all of the bending have their strong suits but also like their weak points and how these characters find the weak points and counteracts with it mm-hmm. when they start fighting. So uh, I'm so excited. <laughs> Aang's journey is just really, really powerful and interesting. And it brings the audience to the idea or the larger idea that I guess. But I think one of the larger questions in Avatar The Last Airbender is kind of like what makes somebody, you know, better than others? Why should one type of bending be better than others? Yeah, right? And it, it parallels with like white supremacy and the idea of one race or one nation being better than another. When we see Aang go through and kind of essentially live as like other benders do because he has to be in hiding and he has to kind of immerse himself yeah. into the different cultures and to see how these other 
other people live you come to see that like even as an avatar even though you've mastered all four there is a use and there is um an importance and validity to each nation and i think that's one of the larger things that avatar the last airbender tries to tackle and to let kids see that like each one of these bending arts and nations, because there are non-benders too, right, have their different strengths and weaknesses. Yeah. And the fault of the Fire Nation is believing that they are supreme. And that's one of the overarching things, but I think it does it so well. And you see it done so well through Aang's journey yeah. as somebody who has to live and embody these different cultures. Is it Aang's theme when, um, what is it, when the music kicks in and it's like, wait, I can't even do it, like, yeah. <laughs> I love it so much and I feel like you should play like oh. if you can find it the different themes too. Yeah. I mean we talk about this but being the last part of this episode and this is the most iconic like ending theme music for me. <laughs> and that like when it comes on I'm like those drums and then the flute is just so Do-do-do. inspiring. Yeah. It's just so inspiring and amazing and tonally like it just fits with the type of world building that the creators are doing. The creators are Michael DiMartino and Brian Konietzko. This is the first time I've actually like said their names out loud. Yeah. <laughs> I think this podcast is a really great platform for us to really talk about this because all this stuff, all these fandoms and things are so, I associate with being online and being on the internet. And yeah. it's really hard for that to manifest outside so i like thank you yeah (laughs) for creating such a really great platform for us to like to talk about the show that we all clearly enjoy but like very rarely talk about so i think it's really cool i hope it continues on (laughs) yeah hopefully i can bring in some very special guests outside of my friends that can shed more insight into the show and maybe like the makings of because I heard they would take like months to storyboard every scene the show is so beautifully crafted and with animation you definitely have to know like it's not like you could pick up a camera and run around and see what looks good like they Mm -hmm. had to have drawn it out really think about it how each shot plays into like the storytelling and how it adds more emotional depth to the story that they're trying to tell and so Yeah, this is just the start. (laughs) And yeah, that um that that concludes our podcast. Do you guys wanna like insert any plugins, social media? (laughs) Do you wanna share your Instagram? I mean you don't have to. (laughs) I have no social media presence. Um, I have no social media um, presence. Wow. <laughs> no, I mean, I I am on Instagram and I am on Twitter, but my Instagram... Private? Um, no, I actually turned it public recently oh. so that I could post more for work. But if you are interested in adding me, <laughs> don't subscribe. add me at <laughs> Anna Ogers on Twitter. It's A-N-N-A-O-J-E-R-S. If you do end up wanting to talk more and expanding on some of the things that we said today, I know Marilyn created a Twitter as well. I did, yes. For the podcast. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Uh, Maybe I will create like a closed group where fans can discuss and build on the themes we have been talking about. And yeah, thank you guys for being on my podcast. It was thanks for having us i think this is the longest conversation i've ever had about, about avatar. the last yeah. airbender well, and we're gonna have so many, so many more. Th- this is just the first episode <laughs> and i'm freaking out like there's just so much to talk about and yeah thank you for listening <laughs> i don't know how to end it how do podcasters usually end it <laughs> thumbs up if you liked it, <laughs> loved it. If you guys like this podcast, I know it's just the first episode, but hopefully I can win you guys over over the next few episodes. If you like it, like, please share it. Tell your friends about it. Um, Everyone I've talked to that have seen the show love the idea of of being able to have a platform to talk about it in a deeper sense. And hopefully in the future, I'm pretty sure I'm going to bring people in that haven't seen the show. So um, we're going to get a bunch of very different perspectives and I'm excited. (laughs) But yeah, that's it.
I feel like I should have a catchphrase. Flame me on, Hotsman. <laughs> Flame me on, Hotsman. <laughs> Avatar State. Yep, yep. Yes. <laughs> so yeah, thanks for listening to Beyond Bending. Um, I'm your host, Marilyn Chantala. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter um, at Beyond Bending Podcast. And yep, as they say in the show, Avatar State. Yep, yep. yep. <laughs>